Let's take a few minutes to talk about the classical pathway analysis approaches. Depending on the analysis approach that you use to analyze your data, uh, that can have a dramatic impact on the type of insights that you're able to derive from your results. So let's talk a little bit more about how these different analysis approaches differ from one another. The first and most common approach is what's called overrepresentation analysis. It's most commonly referred to as enrichment analysis. This is a very simple but powerful technique that leverages simple statistics to identify pathways that may be significant given your data. The other benefit to this particular approach is that it doesn't require very much input data. You can submit a short list of genes that you're interested in and you'll get a list of pathways that are enriched for that set of genes. The downside though to this method is that it makes an assumption on the background of those genes. Because you're only submitting a short list of genes, it has to make an assumption of what is the effectively the denominator. So if you have 100 significant genes, well that's 100 significant genes out of what? Is it 10,000? Is it 20,000? Is it 50,000? Huh. So it makes some assumptions on that. The other downside to this method is that it's, you're en you end up throwing away about 90% of your data. And by that, what I mean is if you've done a, a gene expression experiment where you have observations for 20,000 genes, usually there's only about 1,000 or 2,000 that you're interested in out of that entire set at most, or that are significant given your criteria. Using this method, you end up throwing away the other 90% of, of uh, results that you measured. And that's really a shame because you spend a lot of time and money in uh, getting those measurements. But the biggest limitation of this method is that it assumes that all of the genes in the pathway are independent. And it might be better to say that this method completely ignores the interactions among genes within the pathway. In fact, this method is only going to assess the number of significant genes. And as a result, it can lead to a lot of false positives. Now in just a couple minutes, I'm gonna have a nice slide that will illustrate the limitations of this enrichment analysis approach. But a slight improvement on that uh, enrichment analysis approach is what's called functional class scoring. You may have encountered gene set enrichment analysis, or GSEA, which was pioneered by the Broad Institute. And in this particular model, um, it is more accurate than our simple enrichment model. Because in this method, we're going to use the entire list of genes that were measured. And in the case of gene set enrichment analysis, we will also supply the p-values and supply them in ranked order. And, and sometimes, depending on the type of functional class scoring method, uh, you may uh, provide some weighted scoring based on those uh, p-value significance uh, measurements. But because this is still based on an enrichment model, this particular method is still going to ignore the interactions among the genes on the pathway. It's still a count-based model. And as a result, this method can lead to a lot of false positives. Now, in the mid-2000s, a completely different type of approach was proposed that is, uh, its, its goal was to mimic how we think about pathways from a biological perspective. So in this case, we're trying to identify how perturbed a pathway is, and we can do that by leveraging the topology of the pathway. So in this particular method, we're going to consider each gene's role, their position, the magnitude of change between our two phenotypes, and the interactions among other genes in that particular system. And one of the cool things about this particular model is that it's able to predict what's going to occur in that system given the observations from your data. Now there are some downsides to this method. One is that it requires more data. In this particular model, we need to have uh, measurements for all of the genes uh, between the two phenotypes, their measured fold change, and their p-value. Now when this method was proposed that was a very difficult and expensive task, but nowadays with advents in, and improvements in RNA-seq technology and bioinformatics, uh, it's a much easier uh, thing to accomplish. This method does take slightly longer than the enrichment models. These enrichment models up here can be calculated in a matter of maybe 10 seconds or less, but this topology-based model is very computationally intensive and takes anywhere from 5 to 10 minutes to calculate. 
The other drawback to this method is that it does not work currently on metabolic pathways. We are working on a method to, to do that, but currently it is limited to signaling pathways. In iPathway Guide, we actually use the best of both of these methods. We use a, uh, an enrichment approach to score the pathways, and then we also score the pathways using a topology-based approach that identifies how perturbed that particular pathway is. And the benefit of this is that uh, you are less likely to uh, have false positives because you're now using two different types of evidence to score each pathway. You will only find this in iPathway Guide. So let's talk again about how these two models work. The enrichment approach first assesses the abundance of significant genes in your data set. So again, let's say you have 20,000 genes in your data set. After you threshold for significant genes, either by fold change or by p-value, you're going to be left with approximately 10% of your genes as being significantly differentially expressed, or DE genes. Based on this overall abundance of significant genes, when we look at any pathway, we would expect to see 10% of the genes in that pathway to also be significant, just by random chance alone. But if we see more than that 10% of significant genes in a pathway, then we say that that pathway is enriched. It has a greater number of significant genes than we would have expected by chance alone. And this is how the enrichment model uh, works. You'll notice that this pathway diagram does not have any interactions because this method does not consider the interactions among genes in the pathway. Any kind of enrichment analysis approach, a pathway is just a bag of genes. Now let's talk about how we calculate how perturbed the pathway is. So in this particular model, in, it's a much different approach. Here we take the fold change for a given gene that was observed in our data. And then based on its position and its role in the pathway, we take that fold change that was observed and we propagate it to the next gene that's directly downstream of it. And then we propagate it again to the next gene and the next gene and the next gene until we reach the end of the pathway. Now, these interactions could be activation, could be inhibition, and we take those certainly into consideration and do the signal changes that are appropriate. We even take into consideration when one gene signals multiple genes that are downstream, or if you have several genes that concentrate their signal onto a single gene. Each one of those situations is taken into consideration, and we do that for each and every single significant gene on every single pathway in your data set. Then what we do is we sum all of the gene level perturbations to assess how perturbed the overall pathway is. And this is a much closer approximation to how we would assess the pathway from a biological perspective rather than just counting the number of significant genes. Now the method was originally uh, published in 2007 in Genome Research, here's the citation, and there was a follow-up publication in 2009. Both of these papers were published by members of our team and have received over 1,200 citations to date. So it's a very well-accepted and well-regarded method for assessing pathway significance. Now let me illustrate how this works on a real pathway. So here, let's pretend for a minute that we have a, a single significant gene in this particular pathway. Here we're looking at the insulin signaling pathway. The way the enrichment model is going to assess this pathway is it's going to count the number of significant genes. In this case, we have one significant gene, and it's going to compare that to the total number of genes. Let's call it around 50 genes that are uh, described here on this particular pathway. So our ratio of significant versus non-significant genes is 1 out of 50. Now this is where the enrichment model falls apart. When it compares this to our overall data set, it's going to say, yep, 1 out of 50 is significant and say that this pathway is enriched. But the enrichment model is completely blind to whether this is our significant gene here at the beginning of the pathway or if this is our significant gene at the end of the pathway. Both of those situations have the exact same ratio of significant genes to non-significant genes in this pathway. And therefore, the enrichment model would not be able to tell the difference between these two situations. 
But as biologists, we can tell that this situation here where our significant gene is at the end of the pathway is very different than if this gene here at the beginning of the pathway is our significant gene. So now let's look at this particular pathway in this example from a perturbation perspective. Here, instead of just counting the number of genes, we're also going to look at the interactions. So if we zoom in on this particular significant gene, we see that it's going to have a direct impact on the upper uh, cascade here at the top of the pathway, the genes in the central part of the pathway, and also the genes in the lower part of the pathway. And if we take this fold change, in this case we have a 5.0 fold change in expression, and we propagate it to all of the downstream genes until we can't go any further, we see that this one specific gene is going to affect all of these other genes in this particular system. And this makes sense because this is the main entry point to this particular system. And therefore, when we sum up all of these gene level perturbations, we would be able to identify that this pathway is highly perturbed given this one uh, significant gene because it is crucial in the regulation of this particular system. You would never be able to identify that using an enrichment model. So now let's contrast this example with a slightly different example. Here we're seeing the adherence junction pathway, but we have the same insulin signaling receptor. So in this particular system, if we were to assess this from an enrichment model, again, we have one significant gene out of roughly 50 genes contained on this pathway. It's the exact same ratio as what we saw in our previous example. So the enrichment model would not be able to tell the difference whether this pathway is more important to us or the previous pathway. They would be scored relatively the same because it has the same number of significant genes versus the total number of genes on the pathway. But when we look at the interactions among genes in this particular system, we see that in this case, the insulin signaling receptor does not propagate its signal to any other genes in this particular system. Because in this system, this receptor plays a much less crucial role. So if we try to assess how perturbed this pathway is, we're going to see that this pathway is much less perturbed and therefore much less significant compared to our previous example. And that's really the key difference between looking at your pathways from an enrichment model versus a perturbation model. In iPathway Guide, you'll see both forms of evidence displayed when looking at your pathways. In this two-way plot, you'll see on the horizontal axis, we have the minus log of the p-value that came from the overrepresentation analysis or that enrichment analysis approach. And what that means is those pathways with a lot of evidence for being enriched are over here on the right hand side of this graph. And then we also score the pathways using this perturbation model. So the minus log of the p-value that came from that perturbation analysis is plotted on this vertical axis. So those pathways with a lot of evidence for being perturbed will be along here on the top edge of this graph. Ideally, you want to find those pathways that have both types of evidence. They will be located in this brown section of the graph, and those pathways are least likely to be false positives because they have confirming evidence from both types of approaches. In fact, here's an actual plot of a data set that we analyzed in iPathway Guide. You'll see that we have a pathway over here that has a lot of evidence for being enriched. Again, all that means is it has a large number of significant genes that are uh, uh, contained on this particular pathway. Here we have a pathway that has a lot of evidence for being perturbed, but it's not very enriched. Again, what that means is that there are probably some key genes that are responsible for the regulation of this particular pathway. Now here's our number one pathway. In this particular example, this particular pathway has both types of evidence. It is the most perturbed pathway, and it also happens to be one of the most enriched pathways. And so this is probably the first pathway that we want to look at when assessing pathways. I hope that helps you. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact us. And thank you for